afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Jackie Wise Rhodes, and a year ago I started working here as Associate Professor of Hebrew Bible. And I just, before, um, before starting this open conversation, I want to just give a little context to how I know Mary Shirts. <laughs> And I also want to tell you that there will be time at the end for your questions, uh, and we will pass the mic around. So know that if there's a question that you're dying to ask and I just don't go there, that you will have the chance. Um, I started as a student here at AMBS long ago in the spring of 1999. And my first on-campus class was none other than Greek one with Mary shirts. <laughs> And my life was never the same. <laughs> I came to AMBS not really knowing why I was here, just that I wanted to be. And I thought maybe a semester or two of theological reflection would help me, um, help me know what was next in life. Well, after a couple of weeks, I was hooked, and I knew I was here for the long haul. And after several months, it was Mary who suggested I major in biblical studies within my MDiv which was something I was already starting to think about. Mary mentored me during and after seminary, offering guidance and support when I decided to pursue a PhD, and she didn't even hold it against me that I picked Hebrew Bible instead of New <laughs> Testament. <laughs> 24 and a half years after that first Greek class, I am utterly delighted to be sitting here with Mary. For me, it is a holy moment. I am grateful for Mary's teaching, her care and mentorship, for her amazing sense of humor, for her artful and insightful scholarship, which is exemplified in this beautiful volume. And I'm utterly delighted to introduce all of you to Dr. Mary Schertz. Let's welcome her. <laughs> Mary, I would love to start by asking you the story of how you came to be at AMBS first as a student and then as a professor. Okay. And before I answer that question, let me just say, it is so wonderful to see all of you here. This, when I look out onto your faces, I am a little teary. It is, it is gratifying and um, know that I love you. I love you all. I came to AMBS because I couldn't make a living as a preschool teacher. <laughs> and I had written a paper in a class at Goshen College on um, Anna Karina as a Christ figure. I think that was what it was. And I really liked that paper, so I thought, well, maybe seminary. <laughs> I certainly didn't see myself as a student, maybe a B student, a sort of a middle of the road student. Uh, but that was okay, because it was a graduate school, right? So low expectations. <laughs> what was the last part of your question? <laughs> How did you come to be at AMBS as a student and then a professor? Oh, well, that's how I came to be as a student, because uh, I didn't know what else to do. Quarter century crisis, that, that would be about right, too. I am a professor because Millard Lynn won. First of all, I didn't see myself taking either Hebrew or Greek. I know, this is terribly disillusioning for Jackie. In fact, I petitioned to get out of it. And um, the curriculum committee said, no, I was not old enough to know my mind and <laughs> Basically, so I, you know, I said, do you have to be 40 to be an adult at AMBS? Well, kind of. <laughs> but then I took it and fell in love with the language. Um, Phil Stribble came and talked about Jonah, and she did a liter literary analysis of Jonah. So, and then I, Millard Lind, bless his heart, said to me one day in the lounge as I was putting on my boots to catch the Goshen carpool home one snowy afternoon. He says, Mary, have you ever thought about getting, going on and getting a PhD and then teaching Bible? And up until that moment, no. That, that thought had never crossed my mind. 
And after that moment, it just wouldn't leave me alone. So I applied for grad school thinking, I'd rather fail at this than have to um, regret not, not having tried. So I went, I, I, that was my attitude. So I'd rather fail than not try. And then you came back to AMBS. How did that happen? <laughs> um, well, Gail knows this story better than I do, probably. Um, I said no twice to being on the, on the search committee's list. Um, I don't know, Gail. Maybe you had been there a year when you asked me the first time. And I thought, oh, this is way too soon. I, so I said no. And then I said no the second year as well, thinking, I don't know where this is going. And then the third year, I said, OK, I'll, I'll let my name stand on the, on the committee. It was a good choice. <laughs> it was a very good choice. I don't know anywhere else where I would have actually grown and thrived the way I did here at AMBS. There were some hard times, goodness knows. Um, but the Bible department was important uh, to my development. The emphasis on being text-based um, was, was the ethos of the Bible department. And I learned from that and adopted that and embraced that. And that was very important. So it was, it was the leading of the spirit unknown to me at some points, but nevertheless, um, absolutely, absolutely. Could you describe one of the first times you felt a congruence or a fit between your self-identity and the word scholar? <laughs> Was there an aha moment for you? Another way of thinking about this question, how did you find your scholarly voice and what advice do you have, especially for our first year students that are starting this week as they think about theirs? Yeah. My piece, P-E-A-C-E, mm -hmm. with that topic, was a long time in coming. So there was many years, uh, even as a faculty person, that I wondered about the scholarship part. Um, Certainly, I wasn't becoming or trying to be a big name at the Society of Biblical Literature. That was, I didn't feel that kind of ambition. So what does it mean to be a scholar? Um, Hans de Vete, where's Danielle? Is he still here? Well, Hans de Vete came because Danielle and I were working on this project for IMS called Through the Eyes of Another. And Hans de Vee talks about the ordinary reader and the professional reader. And one of the things that I came to understand through his work was that when we come into seminary as seminary students, when we learn the languages or when we learn how to do scholarship, uh, how to do write papers, how to think critically about texts, how to ask uh, critical reading questions, is that we move from being ordinary readers to being professional readers. So in some ways, every seminarian is a scholar. You've moved away from um, what Hans called generously and with a great deal of appreciation, ordinary readers. And his, his contention was that ordinary readers and professional readers need each other. So ordinary readers need the professional readers, the pastors, the Bible teachers, the people who've gone, gone to seminary, or even um, uh, like my father never went, to, never went to college, but he was such a reader that he probably didn't fit the category of ordinary reader. So uh, even intelligent, self-educated lay people can be professional readers in some sense. But professional readers need to stay rooted in the reality of ordinary people's experience with the text, with the Bible. And also, ordinary readers need professional readers. So it's, it's a sort of symbiotic. Yeah, it needs to go back and forth. 
Um, there are, of course, professional scholars who have lost touch with ordinary readers. And there are also ordinary readers who scorn professional readers. But both, both professional readers who lose touch with ordinary readers lose out, I think, in terms of understanding the text. And ordinary readers who scorn professional readers, I think the same thing happens. They're, 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 there comes a time and a way in which their own readings of the biblical text are marred or hurt or less than they could be by not joining with, um, the, the joining of professional and ordinary readers is, um, seems to me very important. Is there a way that that idea, that joining of professional and ordinary readers um, informed the work on your commentary? Are there, is there an example or two you could offer us? I'm sure. Um, now, it's a little difficult to separate in my mind the times I was with ordinary readers in congregations. Certainly, uh, the people in classes had a great deal to do with my understanding of Luke. But, um, oh, uh, we were talking about South Dakota. Gay and Ed were talking about South Dakota. I went to, oh no, this is Minnesota. I'm sorry, South Dakota. <laughs> Mountain Lake, and did a week of, of, there were two churches there. And I went back and forth between the two churches and did, like the program was open for people in both churches. But, but I went, we went, we changed our location. And we did the Luke's Quest stories out there and the passion and the intensity with which these folks saw themselves in Luke's Gospel saw themselves as bringing something important, vitally important for human life to Jesus. And then were able to walk with the paralytic and the woman who anointed Jesus' feet and the centurion and the, and the 10 lepers and uh, Zacchaeus and the rich ruler and the thief on the cross. So that kind of intensity and passion, I think, were my motivation. Mm -hmm. Uh, for writing the commentary. Thank you. Writing and scholarship in general is a, is, a, is a conversation. What is your advice for those starting out in, in their scholarly journey for how to decide who to be in conversation with? There are so many options, right? How do you find the work of others, scholars or ordinary readers, and integrate that into your work? And perhaps a related question, how do you balance following the promptings of your own creative spirit and relying on sources of other, inf other sources of information? I think it's important to find people who don't agree with you and to read what they have written or what they are saying carefully. I think it's important to find people who do agree with you and also read that carefully. We don't, we don't uh, often come to, Marlon Miller used to tell me, there's nothing new under the sun, Mary. He told other people this too. <laughs> and it's true, and it's true in scholarship. So, Humility demands that we be in conversation with others. Now, <laughs> there's also, in my commentary, I take a risk with, uh, with the two swords passage at the end of the gospel where Jesus says, oh, I told you to go out without any uh, protection and no money and no bag. Now, now you need to change that. You need to buy so go out and buy some swords. And they say, we have two. And he says, that's enough. And it's a passage that has troubled scholars. I mean, some scholars have said it's the most difficult passage in the entire Bible. I'm not sure that's true. 
But in the commentary, I think I come to a really old reading. In other words, I use uh, literary devices from the first century, like chiasm, to understand how Luke is guiding us to read that text. And I'm also um, looking at Luke Acts, in which, in which no one in Acts takes up swords. So no one obeys that. Mm -hmm. Now, why is that? Well, I, I think it's because the people in the, in the first three centuries of Christianity, it wasn't a, a nonviolent warrior was not a problem. They could understand that. And they also understood what Luke was doing with the chiasm in guiding his readers to understand that. There is no one in contemporary scholarship who agrees with me or has written that. Um, John Howard Yoder made a remark, sort of a throwaway remark in the politics of Jesus about the two swords passage being Jesus' last temptation. H.A.J. Uh, J. Kruger, a South African uh, theologian and biblical scholar, talks about that, that passage as having divine warrior language, like stay with me, watch with me, do not be led into temptation. Um, but nobody in the contemporary society Society of Biblical Literature uh, has been saying that. So when I, when I came to, to concluding the commentary, say, let's say four years ago, do I just kind of slip this in under the radar, radar or do I make a big deal out of it? Um, there's no, and I looked hard. I was really like, it's important to have people who agree with you, right? No one did. <laughs> So in the end, I, I gained the confidence to actually just put it out there and say, well, I don't think it's a new reading. I think it's one, a reading that hasn't been, um, I think it's a reading that became problematic with, with Constantine, where it, it just became a problem to have a, a Christian warrior who was not going to fight. Um, so it's not a new reading in that sense, but it's a, it's a new reading to our our contemporary society. And I don't know, Jackie, so that, that still causes me some gulps. <laughs> but I decided to go for it. So. And it's been fairly warmly received, I must say. So. Now, especially among the Mennonite crowd. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what the others say. Is there a way that this image of nonviolent warrior and this is an off-the-cuff question, Mary, so um, let me know what you think. Is there a way that it can especially speak to peace-minded Christians today? Or is there a way that it can help us um, in our perplexing world? Yeah. Yeah, I, I do think so. And I think it challenges us, us as Mennonites, too, because we have been sort of content not to make waves. And um, the disciple who integrates the divine warrior and the suffering servant and then goes to the cross, as Jesus did, as a divine warrior who's not violent and a suffering servant who is not passive, challenges us as um, Mennonite peace theologians, but also as the, as the general, more general society. I don't know what it means. I think it's a kind of lifelong search to try and find ways, small ways and large ways, of integrating this. Um, I'm working on a paper for the Rooted and Grounded Conference about, about how you integrate the divine warrior and the suffering servant in a way that addresses the issue of climate change. So I'll let you know when that when that comes together, which it hasn't yet. <laughs> but you can hear that paper yeah. <laughs> in about six weeks at the Rooted and Grounded Conference here at AMBS. <laughs> You've spoken eloquently about um, drawing on various scholarly ideas and, and resources. What about practical ways that you collaborated with others, colleagues, students, other folks in the community, 
on the development of your ideas. What, what was your handbook for um, getting real world feedback? And could this be transferable to seminary students who sometimes it can feel like you're in your little bedroom typing on your computer all by yourself with your yeah. ideas. How, yeah. can we, how can we draw on yeah. community wisdom yeah. in our yeah. work? Well, collaboration has been um, the delight of my life. I'm, and in so many ways, with, with Institute of Mennonite Studies, with students. And then as a commentator, I had the Luke group. And I want to acknowledge the members of the Luke group who are here today, who are Rachel Miller Jacobs and uh, Ellie Kreider and Barb Nelson Gingrich. And James was a part of that. James Nelson Gingrich was a part of that. And so was Alan Kreider and Rebecca Slough. So, and they read, like we would meet at Barb and James and have a wonderful meal. And they read every, every expository note that I, that I created for the commentary. And they kept me down to earth. And they would say, Mary, I think you're losing your voice here. Mary, this is academic jargon. Um, what do you mean by that? Um, so it was, it was so much fun, and it was so gratifying to have serious responders be a part of that effort. So you will see them acknowledged in the, in the introduction. And um, I would wish for every scholar to have that kind of um, honest, candid, exploratory, mm -hmm. pushing, um, affirming kind of uh, group. It was, it was so, so wonderful. One more commentary question, and then I have some more general ones. Okay. If you think about the project as a whole, I mean, a commentary is a very curious genre of literature, and it's a big commitment. What were some of the key moments in your journey with the commentary? We heard about the um, kind of the key text that you lifted up. What, are some, what were some of the other key moments in the process? And if you think of writing the commentary as mapping Luke, what were some of the features? What were some of the roads that, you, that were already made? Um, did you follow them or make your own path? We've already heard about one of your own paths that you made. Did the borders of your map expand over time? What are some of the, as you think over the past years, how would you describe your journey yeah. with the commentary? With, uh, looking back at the long view. Yeah. I was asked, and I should have said no. I should, well, first of all, I should never have been asked. And second of all, I should have said no. And I'm also eternally grateful that neither of those things happened. Um, I was, Howard Charles had started the Luke commentary. And he faced some medical issues. He had written about 50 pages of it and, and just realized that he couldn't go on with that. And his doctor said, you can write a commentary or you, or you can live, but you probably can't do both. So he decided to live. And then the committee wanted me to take his work and then go on with it in that vein. That didn't work very well. The, the commentary series really needed women authors. So I think that was part of the reason I was asked. Um, I was way too young. Um, it's nothing to do in your first 10 years of service to an institution. It's not, here, here's the way I would say, it's not compatible with teaching to, to being a professor on the one hand and working with students over 30 years was absolutely critical mm -hmm. to, to the work that uh, eventually evolved here. So there's a both and in that. Uh, in terms of time, in terms of getting it done, in terms of, of 
of pleasing Harold Press in terms of deadlines, it didn't work very well. Um, in terms of getting something together that I think is at least uh, the best that I can do, mm -hmm. it did work. It did work. And I have so many people to be grateful for in that. Um, I think the, the main thing, that, there's a couple of things. One is my students over the years helped me see how this, how this book fit together. We are not really taught very well in Sunday school um, to read a, a book of the gospel all at once. Yeah. Or in preaching, we hear snippets of it. Sometimes we'll have a more extended thing, but, but to sit down and read it like a book doesn't happen very often. But at the beginning of every Luke Acts class, I had my students do that. And their insight, and then of course I was doing it along with them. So their, our in, our in, the difference that that made in how we understood the Gospel of Luke was just astounding. And I'll never forget those sessions at the beginning uh, where we, I would just say, what struck you? What, what, what did you notice different? And it was always a heart-touching and lively conversation. Mm -hmm. So that sort of evolution, oh, this thing works together. I'm not saying that every biblical book is a literary masterpiece. Luke, however, is. Um, and so that was, a re that was to take that on and say, oh, yes, this is working as a, as a piece of literature. This works, mm -hmm. um, was, I think, um, uh, in, in great part, a debt that I owe my students. Mm -hmm. um, the two swords thing came, but that came toward, eh, I would say 2010 on, which seems like a long time ago, but <laughs> in terms of the life of the commentary, wasn't, was maybe halfway through, I don't know. Um, well, there was a couple of other things. One is I went to the Abbey for some sabbaticals uh, in, in uh, St. John's in Minnesota, and the Benedictus, Zacharias' song, and Mary's song and Simeon's song, all from Luke, are part of the daily prayer practice up there. And living with those canticles on an everyday basis, um, Made, made some difference. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, not, I'm not finding ways to articulate that very well right now, but uh, it was the dailiness of it, it was the strength of the language, it was the worship that surrounded that. Um, and of course I was working on the, on the commentary at those times too, so. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And Contribution, I mean, you know, I'm here today and, and sort of filled with gratitude toward all the students. Um, well, there was Grant, Grant Miller, who's here today, I believe. Is that, is that, <laughs> my eyesight is a little far. Um, one, one Luke Acts class, I had my students memorize texts from Luke and Acts. And Grant memorized the text of Ananias and Sapphira. And which we think of as an accusatory text. And it's a difficult text. Mm -hmm. And Grant uh, recited that with tears. And um, I'm saying this partly because you're being here today, Grant reminds me, but, but it's typical of the kind of intensity with, with which students approach these texts and made them their own. Mm -hmm. And that making the texts their own was, for me, such a touchstone in the commentary writing. Uh, the strength of that, the, what, 
what Brother Luke offers, <laughs> what Brother Luke is doing for us, the joy, the passion, the tears, the questions, the possibilities, yeah. It's the ever open possibilities of the gospel speaking to us deeply. One of my fond memories of being in class with you, and I think many here would also remember this, were your beautiful opening prayers that you spoke of as a spiritual discipline because you wrote the prayers for that class session for that day. I and did. you brought them to us as an offering. Yeah. I would love for you to, to talk a little bit about that spiritual discipline and the way it sustained you, maybe grounded you in your scholarly career. It certainly sustained and grounded your students who maybe came to class with some trepidation about the Greek accusative. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Well, I came as a young professor at AMBS. I thought I should, I should have some spiritual disciplines. <laughs> <laughs> and I was such a failure. <laughs> I tried journaling, maybe two days. Centering prayer, my mind went all over the place. It never did get centered. <laughs> um, I don't know, nothing really worked. But then I... But then I came upon um, written prayers, short written prayers. I thought, oh, maybe I could do that. Uh, one of my models was Peter Marshall, the, chap the Senate chaplain, um, died in, I think, late 40, 40s or 50s. So I never knew him personally, but I read his books, book of prayers and sermons. And, uh, well, then Walter Brueggemann was another model who came along, um, who's doing some of this. And it became, it became uh, a, a spiritual practice that, that I found deeply uh, satisfying, deeply moving. It connected me to God. It connected me to my students. It connected me to the Bible. It connected me to the Mennonite church. It connected me to the church worldwide. Um, and even to religions other than Christianity. Prayer is the great common denominator in religious experience, I think. And I found it to be so. So from the pragmatic, uh, it was the only spiritual discipline that I could make work for myself. <laughs> so, too a lifelong practice that I have treasured. Thank you. So we've talked a lot about the commentary, but you worked on other things in your life as a scholar. When you think about your whole career up until this point, how would you name, well, you could think of it as your contributions to the scholarly world in the church. You could think of it as how would you name the most vital and important conversations you participated in? Oh, that's a good question, Jackie. Well, I co-authored a book with Perry. Um, it's hard to co-write a book. <laughs> and it's also very exciting. So, yeah, that was life-changing in many ways. I, the, um, when, when Cheryl Bridges Johns came and Alan Kreider was the person who knew her and brought her to campus, and I'll always be grateful, when she said something about orthopathy, and the way she said it was, you Mennonites are good at orthopraxy, like you know how to do the right thing. And she said, and the Catholics are really good at orthodoxy, how to think the really right thing. She says, but you need us Pentecostals so that you know how to feel the right thing. And what she meant by that was aligning oneself with the passion of God, with the love of God for the world. Well, that clicked 
with me. I thought, oh, I think that's what's been missing. Not only in my Mennonite church background, but in biblical studies. Um, so I started thinking about that. Um, I talked about it with the AMBS faculty. I talked about it with Rebecca Slough, and then we worked on this artful response. We collaborated that with that. Uh, Jewel was um, administrating a program. Oh, what was that called? Engaging pastors. Engaging pastors. Yeah, and we did a number of retreats that were. Uh, um, a combination of biblical study, but also sort of personal reflection and group experience, worship. Barb was a part of that. Um, Rachel was a part of that. Rebecca, James are all part of that. Um, and that sort of led to a confessional Bible study which another guest of ours, uh, Ellen Davis, brought with her. Uh, by confessional Bible study, she meant studying the Bible as if our lives depended on it. And that was another sort of, um, that along with the orthopathy and the artful response coalesced into something called confessional Bible study that really governed um, the last 10 years of my uh, professorship here at AMBS. So many collaborations with so many wonderful people. Pastors, people in the area. Um, oh, I took, I took it on the road to Ontario. Um, so it was a fascinating and satisfying kind of work. Was that the question? And I think uh, confessional Bible study is still a part of many AMBS courses. If in a course you are asked to do an artful response to scripture, uh, you know now where that comes from and who inspired us to incorporate that into our pedagogy of interpretation. What is next for Mary the Scholar? <laughs> well, God told me. <laughs> I have this little paper in my pocket that I've carried now. When I got done with the commentary, I thought, oh no, what now? And I was kind of depressed, and I, my sister says, Mary, you're just walking around the house wondering what to do. I said, yeah, I says, I don't know what to do. My life is over. <laughs> I didn't, that's a little dramatic, it didn't quite go that far. <laughs> so one day, I just said, I, th I think maybe God wants me to write something yet. So. In five minutes, I had this list. An SBL article on the two swords. The rooted and grounded paper, which consisted first of a proposal, which was accepted, and now the paper. Thanks to Jackie. <laughs> and then, um, I think an article for the Mennonite, or the, an, or an article, for, like a popular level article for the Mennonite. In, in the Baptist world. Anabaptist world, right, thank you, Rachel. And then a more scholarly one, trying to figure out some of, some of where the two swords argument fits into Mennonite peace theology for either the Mennonite Quarterly Review or the Conrad Grebel Review. And then the other thing that people have been encouraging me to do for years is a book collecting uh, my classroom prayers. And I've tentatively titled that Deepest Blue of world and soul, public prayer and private life. And Rachel, I've been in conversation with Rachel and some others, Rachel's encouraging me to make it somewhat mem memoir-ish. <coughs> A memoir would totally intimidate me and I would not do that. But to intersperse some memoir writing with the prayers um, is probably what I'm thinking about doing. So. Yeah, that's on my list. <laughs> Mary, does, does this list live in your pocket all the time, or where else does it reside? Does this list live in your pocket all the time? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's going back in now. It's going back in her pocket. <laughs> <laughs> it's, getting sh it's getting shabby, but... <laughs> she says it's getting shabby. <laughs> I have... 
just so you all know, I have two more questions and then I'm going to open it up. So get ready with your questions. <coughs> Mary, were you the second woman on faculty at AMBS? No. Gertrude? Bertha? Gertrude Roten. Bertha Harder, Gertrude Roten. Gail. Gail. Gerber Kuntz. Mary Oyer? No, she was after me. Were you the fourth, possibly? Yeah. That was after. June and Marlene were both afterwards. Could you talk a little about being one of the first women on faculty and how feminist biblical interpretation, feminist theology informed your career and your life here? <laughs> um, yeah, I was not the first woman on faculty. I was, however, for 25 years, the only completely full-time woman professor at AMBS, which was um, frustrating in many, many ways. I probably wouldn't have projected that happening when I first joined the faculty. I thought, surely, I wouldn't be the only woman who is full-time. Um, I was also the only woman on the Bible department for all those years, so... Um, do I know how to get along with guys? Yeah, I do. <laughs> and I loved them all. <laughs> and they loved me. But it was not always. Um, I was always glad when, he had, when we had a woman uh, biblical department assistant like Sharon Norton. Um, because then, then I wasn't the only woman at the, at the meetings. So. Um, There were always feminists who were more radical than I was. And there were feminists who were less radical than I was. So I fit there in the middle somewhere. I think Mennonites in general uh, tend to be on the conservative side. Now, we don't often feel that at AMBS. We think we're the liberal people in the Mennonite church. Um, but when we, when we interact with people of other faiths, it becomes pretty clear that theologically uh, we're, we're on the more conservative half of things. We still attend to the Bible, for instance. And um, we still believe in a sovereign God. So when I was with feminists outside of the... Mennonite circles, it was clear to me that I was, I was meandering somewhere around in that middle. Mm -hmm. I learned lots uh, from, from, from people on either side of me. I learned lots from, um, oh, am I going to be able to remember these people? Mary Daly. Um, and I also learned quite a bit from the evangelical women who were really uh, struggling with issues like women in ministry and a more a view of the Bible that was more that had more to do with what's the word it's not infallibility or is it Inerancy. yeah uh, a, a more literal kind of uh, b belief in in biblical mm -hmm. inerrancy So, no, I think I learned from both ends of that and, and um, profited. Our students were, some, were sometimes more radical than I was, but our students were often more conservative than I was. So that played out in the classroom, and I spent quite a bit of time doing what I would call patient education <laughs> of, um, of people who were, especially I would say in the first 10 years. That eased up, I think, considerably later on. Um, but we were still having conversations about whether women should be in leadership in the church in those early years. So, you know, not that long ago. Mm -hmm. And 
and a, and it's an age ago too. I mean, so I'm indebted to feminism. There's no question, and I'm also well. I I had a choice at one point. This happened when I was a student here at AMBS. Uh, some of my friends were leaving the church, the church, not just the Mennonite church, but the church uh, altogether because it was too patriarchal. And while that had some appeal, uh, it was also clear to me that what feminism lacked was the ability to deal adequately with sin. Um, I couldn't blame everything that we women were doing to each other on patriarchy. And I just didn't think that patriarchy was going to be the reason why evil existed. Now, is patriarchy good? No, I'm not going to say that. Um, but I'm also not seeing it as the source of all evil. You got me into this, Jackie. Uh <laughs> Now I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> well, I mean, feminism is history. Yeah. There are feminisms. Thank you. This is my last question, and then we'll turn it over to you all. What are some of your hopes, dreams, um, anticipations for the future of AMBS or the church? This will surprise no one here. My dream for the seminary and for the church is that the Bible can continue to be a vital part of our life together. Now, I don't mean that the Bible is um, not subject to criticism. And I don't mean that the Bible should be entertained or uh, followed slavishly. And I don't mean that we have to tie ourselves up in knots uh, about the authority of scripture. What I want is that the Bible continue to be our companion, that it continue to be a resource that we reach for in hard times and in joyous times. These are the records of people's relation with God through, what, I don't know, two or 3,000 years. Um, it's dated, and it doesn't satisfy all our needs. But it's time-honored and can be, what, a haven in the storm? Uh, something that we can continue to find life in something in which we can meet each other in. I once said to some students, the Bible belongs to whoever reads it. Hmm. So coming together with a text has been probably the most important single practice of my life. And, and the, the community Bible that's being developed, I mean, fostered that. Hmm. We had a group at our church. Um, so whatever, whatever nurtures uh, reading and reading together and reading for, uh, reading as if our lives depended on it, going back to confessional Bible study, uh, will enrich us as seminarians and for the future of the Mennonite church and the church in the world, the world that God loves. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jackie. That was delightful. It was so much fun. We've got 10 minutes left for your questions. Mary, I was in your first Luke, at, at Luke Acts class. Uh, your first year here as a professor was my last year as a student. Uh -huh. And one of the things that just stands out to me that I appreciated so much was that before that, many of the classes that I had taken felt like we were dissecting the text, taking it apart. And you brought this literary narrative analysis that was like showing all the cool ways it all fit together. And I just, that just 
made me so happy and so excited. And it developed a sense of mystery and awe that this text was so wonderfully made. And probably not even intentionally always, you know. And I thank you for that. I thank you for making the Bible an awesome text. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Janine. Mm. Was, I don't remember, Janine, if we were in that same class. Probably. I, I think so. Uh, and another thing that stood out was precisely the way you taught us to attend to the narrative, the story, and its twists and turns. Uh, you would, would come into class with two or three, maybe more, of perfect questions. <laughs> and and I, I still marvel looking back at that. Um, and then you would have these mini lectures if there was a point that was vital that we understand and, and would do that. But then, then another question would follow. And you trusted the class so much in the way you handed the questions to us and turned us into the text. Uh, it was an incredible gift. And, and, and it seized it, it seized our imaginations. Uh, and so thank you. Thank you, Dave. Mary, you talked about many conversations that you had with uh, people and external conversations outside of the text. I wondered about conversations that you had with characters in Luke. And are there yeah, 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 yeah. any specific conversations that you'd like to comment on uh, that you've had either with uh, characters in Luke or with Luke himself? Yeah. Oh, there are many. Zacchaeus would be one. But what I'm going to mention today is my favorite four, which is the rich ruler, the good Samaritan, and Mary and Martha. And I think what's going on there is that you have, you have two, two types of intellectual work and two types of service work. And the two types are the kind that try to justify itself and the kind that doesn't try to justify itself. So you have the rich ruler who's trying to use intellectual inquiry to justify himself. And you have Mary who is not trying to use, I mean, she's using intellectual inquiry. She's sitting at Jesus' feet, but she's not trying to justify herself. And then you have the good Samaritan who serves without trying to justify himself, just because the person in need is there. And you have Martha, dear Martha one of my favorite people in the entire world, but seeking to justify herself with much serving. Now, why are these four my favorites? Well, I struggle there. I, I do, I mean, it's a spiral. I, um, I think things are going pretty well. I'm sort of spiritually on top of things, and, and then not so much. And then, I confess I'm trying to justify myself, and I give that up. It's not going to work. And then, of course, God is gracious. And I can be on the side of Mary and the Good Samaritan for a while, but it keeps, you know, it's an ongoing struggle. So, yeah, those four are my dear uh, and constant companions through life. Mm -hmm. So Mary, I'm curious, because you've, you've alluded to this a little bit, but um, you've been part of the, the Bridge Folk group and gathering, and part of your commentary was written in, at, at an abbey, a Benedictine abbey. Um, 
Can you reflect a little bit on how it's kind of ecumenical back and forth between some streams of Catholicism and your own Mennonitism and Anabaptism have shaped your identity as a scholar, shaped your commentary, um, and maybe shaped your hopes for the church? I think I might be trying to get you to tell us the feed my sheep story. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can answer that question or not, Melinda. Um, I think what going back and forth, and I, and I spent three sabbaticals at the Abbey. That's a lot. And I kept going back there because it kept drawing me. The, the, hour, the prayers of the hours, the monks, the um, conversation at the ecumenical center, the woods, the lakes, I mean, Minnesota all kept drawing me. I think, um, I'm really glad to have this time to reflect on that, Melinda, because I don't know that I've thought about this before. But I think what happened is that I became both less Mennonite and more Mennonite. I became less Mennonite in, oh, there's a lot of different ways to look at all of these issues, from the Eucharist to baptism to service to worship. Um, and felt so enriched by, by um, that broader experience, so grateful for that. I also gained confidence in what Mennonites have to offer the world. People at the Abbey were interested in what I thought, um, or what Mennonites thought. Sometimes I was better at representing us than others, hmm. but I kept trying. And um, in the end, I thought, oh, there's a reason for this commentary series. <laughs> I think a lot of the writers of the, of the different volumes have wondered that. But I do believe there is a, there's a, there's a place for this series. There's a place, a need for the Anabaptist view. Do I know how Anabaptist this volume is? I, that's the struggle, I don't know. It's me, I'm an Anabaptist, and I wrote it. And in the end, that's, that's gotta be enough. <laughs> but I do believe that there is a place for our voice. But I think that going back and forth is what taught me, taught me that. Well, Mary, one of the things that I remember from some class that you taught, I don't know which one, uh, was an exercise to do a canon within a canon. Yes. Uh -huh. um, which is to say, uh, one one week the exercise was introduced, and the next week we were to show up with the ten passages that if we had to discard everything else in the Bible, those are the ten we would keep. Um, and some people showed up with, you know, Isaiah, Genesis, Right. You, you weren't thrilled about that, but moved on for the sake of time, I think. And so my question, I think, is related to the question of who are your characters. My question is, if you had to keep three pericopes in Luke, what is your Luke within Luke? Beautiful. Oh, Brent, what a lovely question. <laughs> and difficult. Yeah, the two swords, certainly. I've given my life to that passage, so I have to do that one. Yeah. The 10 top texts without which I cannot live, I think is how we. And Perry and I started that in our book, and then Marlene and I did a, a forum on it, which was interesting. Um, I think, yeah, the two swords passage. Oh, I think um, the Magnificat would also have to be in that. Um, now. One, two, three. Oh, la, la. <laughs> Let's give her ten. <laughs> <laughs> or at least five. Yeah. I think my, um, my third one would maybe be the anointing woman in chapter three. Mm -hmm. And of course you can't talk about, this is what students, when I gave them that, that assignment, top ten text, they would say, the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> So I'm going to say the anointed woman, but then, of course, all of Luke's quest stories. Right. So that's a way to cheat on the assignment. 
um, the, the quest stories would, I mean, those seven texts are just um, wonderful. And I've used them in so many different ways with so many different people and heard so many stories. Could you define the quest stories? Sure. Um, they're stories in which someone comes to Jesus with something vital, a need vital for human well-being. And there's obstacles in the way uh, to the fulfillment of the quest. And then the obstacles are overcome or not. The first three are at the beginning, or in the Galilean ministry. So it's um, the, par the person who is paralyzed and is let down from the roof of the home by four friends. The second one is a centurion with the sick servant who says, Jesus, don't even come to my home. I'm not worthy. And the third one in that, be in that beginning group is the woman who anoints Jesus' feet. And Simon says, um, if Jesus knew who was touching him, he would do something different. Um, then there's three as, as Jesus comes into, Jer as he ends the Jerusalem journey and comes into Jerusalem. Those are the 10 lepers and Zacchaeus and the rich ruler. And then the seventh one is the thief on the cross which is the most poignant of the seven. Sometimes I've added Mary and Martha to that if I'm working with women, just because I think it has some characteristics of the, of the quest story. Um, the quest story designation is Robert Tannehill's contribution, uh, Narrative Unity of Luke Acts, which is really a real, it's what I used for a textbook for many years and really important in my I should have mentioned that earlier when you were talking about what influenced me. Um, there's so many. The, the, the Benedictus, uh, Zacharias' song. The Lord's Prayer in Luke, in Luke and its context. The Last Supper, the tenderness of that last meal. Yeah, I think that's, just, that's what I can do for you, Brent. <laughs> I think we are sadly out of time. I would invite you to show your appreciation to Dr. Mary Schertz. <laughs> Thank you.